Take your Bibles, if you will, tonight. Turn with me to Psalm 99. Psalm 99. And uh, I, I really appreciate folks coming on Wednesday night. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of churches don't see fit to have churches church on Wednesday anymore. I'm glad that not only we have it, I'm glad you come. Amen. I'm glad we're right on the main road. That way people see the lights on somebody here. Amen. I like that. And, uh, and so at least they know we're here. I tell them about it on the radio. And, uh, and us being, you know, having as many outputs that we have, you know, YouTube, Facebook, radio, and, uh, and you. You, you. You're one of the biggest, uh, um, you know, as far as outputs of the church, as far as going out, telling people, showing people, and getting people to come here, okay? So I want to encourage you to be faithful to that. I'm praying the Lord will just breed more faithfulness in, our, in, in people this year and grow and grow us and that we'll see people grow not only physically but uh, spiritually as well and uh, because we need some spiritual growth in, in, in America. The, 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 the biblical knowledge is waning. Uh, because and it's easy to see because people don't go to church as much as they did and churches don't have church as much as they did and so the, the opportunities to learn are not as many as they used to be and very few people will take it upon themselves to study and read the Word of God and do it on their own and, uh, and so they need, they need help and uh, just like the Ethiopian eunuch uh, you know when Philip came to him he says Do you understand those what thou readest and he says how can I unless some man guide me and so you you got to have that guy that that guide, and uh, we need to pray for preachers. We need to pray for missionaries. Uh, we 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 need them. The world needs them. Okay, so let's read this psalm, and then we're gonna make some observations tonight about it, and uh, and talk about some things I think will be interesting to you. I I I find all of it interesting. Amen. Whether it be over there in the genealogies, or it be over there in Revelation, or wherever it is, I get it, I find it all interesting. Amen. And I believe everything. I believe, I, like I said, I believe that I, I believe uh, Jonah was swallowed by a whale and, and stayed in there three days, three nights. I believe that. I believe Jesus died and was buried and stayed in the grave three days. And I believe he died. And I believe he was gloriously resurrected the third day. I wasn't there, but I believe it. Amen. And uh, I, I believe it rained forty days and forty nights. And I believe it flooded the earth. I believe that. I don't believe. I, I don't. I don't believe part of the earth was flooded. I believe all of it was flooded. But the reason I say that because of what the Bible says. And I, and I believe it. Amen. And uh, who are we to go in the Word of God and start picking and choosing what we think is true or not? You, you know, be careful because when you do that, what happens is, you know, God's made you a promise that if you call on Him, He'll save you. That's a promise. Amen. I believe that. And, uh, and the hope of my salvation is based on what God said. Amen. And the hope of your salvation is based on what God said. And, uh, and so everything is true in the Word of God. And I, and I believe every bit of it. Let's turn our attention to Psalm 99. This is a, three, a theocratic psalm. It's one of the uh, several theocratic psalms where it's, all, it's acknowledging and recognizing that Jesus or the, the, is on the throne. And it says, look at the first three words, the Lord reigneth. So you, so you know, you see this as a theocratic psalm when you see that, the last several psalms that we've seen, we've seen that words like that. It goes on, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Now I want you to underline that right there. The psalmist is, is giving us a little bit of a history lesson, telling us who this Lord is and, who, and where he sits, and, and, and going back, giving us a little bit of a lesson here. It's kind of subtle, but you got to look for it and listen for it, okay? Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and He is high above all the people. Let them praise Thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. The King's strength also loveth judgment. Thou dost establish equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at His footstool, for He is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them. You might want to underline that. It's interesting. In Sunday school, we're, ta we're talking about the priesthood. Okay? Kind of interesting. Moses and Samuel anyway. anyway. Okay? 
and uh, among them that call upon his name, they called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. It's kind of interesting, that cloudy pillar is an interesting sort of uh, thought that he's teaching just a little bit in there. He's throwing something out there for us. And uh, you have to sort of dig a little bit to, to, to get it, okay? Thou answerest them, O Lord our God, thou wast a God that forgavest them, though thou tookest vengeance of their inventions. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Now, how many times have we heard that already in this song? A couple of times, right? For the Lord is holy. We see that in his name in, in verse 3 is holy. We, 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 so we know that God is holy. And one of the things that I want to stress to us, and I see this, and, and you know, people look at me and they see me as they see me as one of these closed minded independent uh, preachers who just got some quirks about him that just prefer some things that are really not shouldn't be preferred you sort of making a mountain out of a molehill, so to speak. but I really think that when you and I come into the presence of one such as Jehovah God. I believe that we ought to come into His presence with reverence. Amen? Amen? Because He is holy. Amen? Amen? There's a reason why in the Old Testament God gave instruction on the proper way to worship God. And I, I'll be honest, when you, you, you know, when one king went into the temple and took all the golden shields and replaced them with brazen shields, and what did they do? They lowered the standards of the temple. And today in America and in the world, we have lowered the standards of God's house. Now, I understand this is brick and mortar and cloth, and I understand that. But so was the temple and the tabernacle in the wilderness. So was that. But God said it was holy. And God treated it with such holiness that if somebody went in the wrong room, they died. And they had to treat it with respect. And that's something that we need to get back to. Because the Lord is reigneth. And He is holy. The very first verse that we say we see here, he says, let the people tremble. There's no fear of God. I mean, he sitteth between the cherubims. I mean, again, these subtle Old Testament references, remember what's in the old concealed is in the new revealed. We see here the Lord here, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's Jehovah God. Every time you see that in all caps in the King James, you see that, that's Jehovah God. That's the sacred four consonants of the Hebrew language that make up Jehovah. That's His name. That's, who, that's when Moses asked Him in Exodus 3 verse 14, well, when I go tell the people that you and Pharaoh, hey, let my people go, they're going to ask me who sent me, who am I going to tell them? And he says, tell him the I am that I am have sent thee. That's Jehovah. The one who is, the one who was, and the one who is always will be. Amen? So we, we see this theocratic psalm, and I put a sort of subscription under this Psalm 99, the Lamb upon His throne. The Lamb upon His throne. And it's a theocratic psalm. The king is not coming in this psalm. The king is here. Because he mentions it the very first thing. The Lord reigneth. He's not going to reign. He reigneth. You see that. So the, 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 the poet who's writing this, he's writing in all three tenses. Futuristic, present, and past. 
And he's going to mention everything that in between here. It views the Lord as the one who is to come, the one who is, and the one who was. The one who occupies the tenses of time, the one who sits upon the throne, who is eternal and almighty. The psalmist easily, this psalm easily divides itself into three parts. I'm going to give you that tonight. Okay? It easily divides itself into three parts. So the one who sits not only in the tenses of time, past, present, future, but also who sits there as prophet, priest, and king. Only one that ever did that. Okay? Because in the Old Testament, God was very strict. Remember in Sunday school we learned that those that occupied the king role could not go and do things of the priest role. God frowned upon that. If you don't believe it, ask Saul. Okay? He had a problem. And he said he, he didn't wait on the, the priest. He did it himself, and, and that wasn't good. And, uh, and so the, the same way with the prophets. You didn't see that. However, we do have a couple of instances in the Old Testament. we get there, and hopefully we'll have time. We'll get there, and I'll point it out anyway, and maybe I'll tantalize your, your palate a little bit spiritually. You'll go look a little deeper and, uh, and, and see this thing about Moses and Samuel. It's kind of interesting, okay? Notice I didn't say Aaron, because Aaron was the priest, remember? He was the priest. But I, I, I'll go ahead and just wet it there a little bit, and then we'll stop, and I'll back up, and then we'll go forward again. How about it? Moses actually did priestly ministry. Go back and look. He did it. God accepted it. Moses was the one that actually consecrated Aaron for the priesthood. Moses wasn't a priest. Samuel who was a prophet, actually did some of the work of the priest as well. And it, 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 but those two, were very, it, that, was, that was rare. And those two men provided and, and, and had a, what I would refer to as an intercessory ministry. It was an intercessory ministry that unique times when they were to do because there wasn't somebody. See, Moses did it. Why? Because there was no priest. So he consecrated the priesthood. Samuel did it. Why? Got to ask yourself the question. Well, why did Samuel do it when he didn't supposed to? Because the priesthood became corrupt under Eli and Phinehas and Hophni, remember? When they defiled the priesthood. And so basically, you know, Samuel, you know, said, now he, he did it. So there was a reasoning. So, but, so we, we know that the offices are separate, but in Jesus Christ, they all come back together. Prophet, priest, and king. In Israel, men, you know, it, you know it, they separated it, but yet in Christ, they all come back into one, into, into all three. So let's look at these three real quickly tonight, and uh, we, we, we may not have enough time, but I'm going I'm I'm to start it anyway, okay? And... Uh, First of all, we want to look at the ideal prince. The ideal prince. In the first four verses here of Psalm 99, we see the Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is nigh above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou dost establish equity, thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. So first of all, under the ideal priest, we want to look at, first of all, the Lord's majesty. The Lord's majesty. And the Lord is exalted upon His eternal throne. He's exalted upon His eternal throne. The king who has the marks of Calvary is the one that is sitting, sitting on the throne of God. Take your Bibles and go over with me to the book of Revelation, if you will, and look with me in chapter 4. Revelation chapter number 4, as we sort of cross-reference a little bit and get a glimpse of something here. And I want you to see if you see something that might, you know, correlate with Psalm 99. So as we, as, as we're looking at the Lord's majesty, Look with me in Revelation chapter 4. We're beginning to read in verse 6. And it says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, notice this, in the midst of the throne, all right, 
In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast like a face of a man, and the fourth beast like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, is, and is to come. So we see the Lord's majesty in the fact that He is exalted upon His not temporal throne, but His eternal throne. He is the one who was, who is, and as the Bible says, is to come. Let's keep on reading. It says, and, when thou, and those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth, how long? Forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him, and liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created." Does not John correlate with the second chapter of Colossians? Does not Colossians go back to Genesis 1, or 1, 2, and 3? We all correlate together. So we see the Lord exalted on His eternal throne. The King who has the marks of Calvary is sitting in the midst of these creatures. I want you to think about it. One like a lion, one like a calf, one like a man, and one like an eagle. You think about all those eyes that are focused right there. Their whole you know, existence is to do what? To, say, to, to do one thing. To say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, is, and is to come. Now, let's go back to our Psalm 99. We see in this that little glimpse that we have of Revelation chapter 4. We have the glimpse of the goodness of God. We have the glimpse of the goodness of God. You know, one of the things that God, you know, we, I think we miss in the Genesis account of things is how good God really is to man. And God is good to us even when we're not good for ourselves and don't know what's good for us. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. We don't know what's good for us most of the time. Adam, he thought, he, taken to the garden, the, 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 the uh, fruit of the garden, he was going to see this. But go back, let's l- listen very carefully to what God said about Adam. Go back very carefully and see what God said about the garden. And let's see where these cherubims come in. Remember what he said in Psalm 99? It says, He that sitteth between the cherubims. Okay, that's the Lord. Think about those beasts that we have, the lion, the calf, the man, the eagle. Go back to Genesis 3 with me. Look there, and uh, as we begin to read in Genesis 3, verse 22, it says, And the Lord God said, now this is the part of the account we don't talk about very much. It says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and do what? Live forever. Now, how many times have you read that and missed it? Now, the only thing we focus on in Genesis 3 is what? He ate the the fruit, sin came into the world, and he got expelled from the garden. Bam, end of story. That's about all we ever focus on, right? Why did God put this account from 22, 23, and 24 in the book? Why did God expel Adam from the garden? Because he says man has become one of us, knowing both good and evil. And he says unless he also go to that tree of life and partake of it and live forever, guess what? In the sin and wretchedness that he's in. God was good to get Adam out of the garden. If he hadn't, he would have taken forth the tree of the, of, the, of the life and lived forever in a forever lost 
and devastated state of sin. Think about that. God's good. Amen. Amen. How much importance did God put upon this? Well, I'm not through yet. Let's go on now. Therefore, why? Because man may do this, right? Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden, expelled him from Eden. All right? Well, all the time we don't, we, that's all we ever remember. Kicked him out. Right? But what else did he do? Look, and he says, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So, verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Edom, Eden, what? Cherubim. So we see these cherubims, and that's what I'm focusing on. And a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Why? So man can't get to it. So man can't get to it. We see the goodness of God in these cherubims. We see the grace of God in these cherubims. Where we, we, you know, you think about in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, when you go into the Holy of Holies, the first thing you see is the Ark of the Covenant. The thing on the Ark of the Covenant in gold or what? Cherubims. You have that, and they have wings that are pointed that touch across the, the Ark of the Covenant, right? Now, what, what's it? And then Shekinah glory, the presence of God were to come into the, in the Holy of Holies, and where did it reside? Between the cherubims. That's where it resided. But I want to go a little bit deeper. One time a year, the high, the, the high priest would take the sacrifice that was done for the nation of Israel for that year. He would enter into the Holy of Holies twice. He would go in once and do the incense. That basically puts a lot of smoke in there so that he's not apt to look upon the ark because if he did, he'd die. If he touched it, he'd die. So he had to go in there with the incense first, come out, get the blood, go back in, and sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice where? Where did he put it? On the mercy seat. That's where he put it. What's the mercy seat? The top of the ark. That's where it is. The word mercy seat in the Old Testament, if you look it up in the Septuagint, which is the Greek uh, Greek, uh, translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, you'll find the same word used for mercy seat in the Old Testament is the same word used in 1 John 2, propitiation. It's interesting. That God is the covering, the satisfaction of our sins. He's the propitiation of. All right? So, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, what would he do? He'd take the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it seven times where? In the midst of the cherubims. Now, what were those cherubims looking at? Now, we know what the cherubims in the garden are looking at. They're looking every which way to keep man from the knowledge of the, of the tree of life, right? What's the cherubims on the ark looking at? The only thing they see is blood. The blood. They see the sacrifice. They see the glory of God. That represents the grace of God. We see the government of God also. Where where do cherubim show up in the government of God? In the book of Ezekiel. We see we see that in the in the ghost. So cherubims are are accounted to the government of God. Fourthly, the glory of God. We saw in Revelation. Won't read it again, but in Revelation four it says, "Holy, holy, holy." We see cherubims again. It's amazing how they, we we see these things. So here in Psalm, the poet, the psalmist is saying. The Lord reigneth. Now we know who the Lord is. We know who Jehovah is. That's Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord reigneth. Let the people tremble. He sitteth. Where? Between the cherubims. Boy, does that not make Jesus God? Amen. See that deity. See that right there. That's that's something right there. Let the earth be Move. So we see the Lord's majesty and the Lord exalted upon an eternal throne. And secondly, we see the Lord exalted above all earthly thrones. In verses 2 and 3, the Lord is great in Zion and He is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name for it is holy. 
Now, you go back and look at history, Napoleon, Hitler, you know, people like that, you know, and back before that, since then, we have all kinds of people that have gone on to tear down thrones of other, of other people. We've seen that. One day, the Lamb of God will come, who took away the sins of the world, will come and pull down all kingdoms and authorities and set up His rule and reign and rule forever. Amen. And we see that because he's above all earthly thrones. All earthly thrones. Not some of them. You know, men just think they have everything figured out and got everything, all the power. Look, you can shoot all the missiles you want. It's not going to do any good. Amen. Because he is the Lord who reigneth. All people at that point in time will acknowledge, and this is what I like, they're going to acknowledge three things, and I'll close tonight. They will acknowledge three things. Number one, they will acknowledge Christ's authority. Amen? That's number one. Number two, they will acknowledge the administration of the Jews. Number three, and the ascendancy of of Zion. Where is the capital going to be? Jerusalem. Why is that? That's where the throne will be. Why is that? Because that's where the Lord's going to be. And He will pull down all kingdoms and authorities. Amen? Because that's the Lord's majesty. As this psalmist is putting. A theocratic psalm. He's not, he's not going to reign. The Lord reigneth. Amen? He, sit, he sitteth between the cherubims. He is in total, absolute, positive control. And, uh, and I don't know about you, but I love it. Amen? Amen? I look around and I see these people say, we're going to do this, going to do that. I say, yeah, the Lord will. That's why the Bible tells you, you better say this, if the Lord wills, we may do this or that. Because... I remember one time my preacher, and I'll close with this, this example. I remember one time my preacher, Brother Mike Odom, he's retired now. He, uh, he used to always say, he says, you know, I believe we ought to be so attuned to the Lord's will that he says, when I mow the grass, I actually pray and ask God what direction I ought to mow the grass in. He says, I think that's how in tune we ought to be to God's will. That's pretty in tune, amen. said, okay, Lord, which way you want me to go this time? You want me to go east, west, north, south, diagonally? Which way you want me to go, Amen. And, uh, but we should be in tune with the Lord's will. Amen. And we'll look at this. We'll finish up this psalm again. Uh, uh, what, Wednesday week? Okay. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you, Lord, again for allowing us to be here. I thank you for these that are here. I pray you, I pray you bless each one. I pray that, Lord, you just uh, answer the prayers that, Father, we put up with you tonight. That, Lord, that you will just bless each one that was named. Lord, give doctors wisdom. Give peace. Give comfort. Give strength. And I pray to give doc doctors wisdom and direction. And I pray that, Father, in clarity. I pray that, Lord, above all, just show yourself mightily. And I pray that we'll go out and talk loud and proud for you. And, Lord, live a life to, ex to exalt you in all that we say, do, and think. Bring us back our next appointed time, we pray and ask. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Love you. And